Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm even more excited. Where, Donnelly, where are you? Because I want to get my picture. Like, I've been looking. I'm like, how do I want maybe like a po is that it? Yeah? OK. All right. Awesome. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about owning your body's data. I am the only thing that's keeping you from lunch. So yeah, I get to draw this out. No, I'm joking. I, I won't draw it out at us all. Um, this talk is sort of built from uh, the TED Talk uh, that I've given. Don't, those are my mom. My mom watches it. She finds a different computer at the library just to show her support. Um, but talking about ways that we can use uh, data that we collect from our body to make decisions about our health. And so that's kind of where I'm going to take you today. This was an email that I got from Fiona. Um, she says, Dear Talithia, I'm ashamed to say that, that at 33, I've yet to learn uh, myself how my body works. My interest in this subject was peaked after I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Probably some of us may suffer from that as well. In all of his sexy symptoms glory. Unfortunately, dealing with doctors was an exercise in frustration, she says. This prompted me to start researching how I could take control, understand, and aim for healing versus symptom management. Somewhere in all of this, I came across your TED Talk. In my experience, far too few women are aware of the reasons why their body acts the way it does, me included. And reading, reading da hard data is either too boring or flies over one's head. Not for any of us in this room, but okay, okay all right, Fiona. Uh, your example was simple yet beautiful and enlightened me uh, to the why behind one nuance of my amazing being. So thank you. Um, it was really special for me to get this email from her because it really sort of validated the need to help people think about the data that they produce from their own body and how they can take ownership of that and how they can use that in decision making. So question for you, what kind of data do you collect about your body or what types of data do people collect about your bodies? Let me see your hands. Get the blood flowing. Yes, right here. You got to yell it out. Your monthly flow, yes. Don't we do that, guys, in the room? Yes. Sleep, Sleep data, yes. What else? Two hands back there, go ahead. Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Temperature. Body temperature. Yes, yes. Go right ahead, I'm sorry. Exercise data. Exercise data. Weight. Weight. Mm. <laughs> yeah. She said yours, we're like, yeah, who really takes their weight? Like, no, I don't want to see it, really. I can tell when, they, when it won't button. I'm like, I know, I know it's changing. It. Um, so we collect data with all types of devices. How many of you have on a device right now that is collecting data about your body? Yes. How many of you use any of that data that gets collected? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, you should, you should feel ashamed. Yeah, you should. We're going to talk about how you can do that today. Next question, why is it important to understand your body's data? Yes. Change tells you that, that's right. Because if it's not changing, guess what? You're dead. So yeah, <laughs> right? Change tells you, I'm glad you like that. Yeah. What else? Why is it important? Yeah. Keep track, of Keep track of progress. That weight loss progress that we're all making progress on. Why else is it important? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can help others. Right? When my, my father-in-law got sick, I remember taking his data to the doctor because, you know, he, dad, what, he, didn't, he was 86. He didn't look at it. But I started to see how his health was actually improving as his diet changed. Absolutely. Right, lots of things that we can do when we collect that data. So um, let's talk about how we can use our personal data to sort of create a digital footprint, right? That's kind of where we're going to go with this talk. Sleep data, you mentioned it. I think this is my husband's one Evening, falling asleep at 9.35 p.m. <laughs> Look there, no time to fall asleep. Just, just knocked out, really, just, uh. Did he wake up? No, no. Was he restless? Eh, six times or so. He was in the bed for almost seven hours. He was actually asleep for almost seven hours. Yours truly, on the other hand, I went to sleep earlier, believe it or not, and what happened? Woke up twice, maybe some kid was breastfeeding, somebody had to go pee, I don't know. It was twice, restless 16 times. 
But having this data is beneficial because now I can understand why I, I, I was in the bed so long. I don't understand why I wake up tired. Oh, it's because I woke up literally, you know, 18 times last night for different reasons. My body was restless, right? So information that we get just by looking at your actual sleep. How many of you actually look at your sleep data? Okay, or know your sleep patterns? Absolutely. My family is really competitive. And uh, even with the boys, with the, we, we have three boys, and uh, we each had Fitbits, and we would do these family competitions to make sure that people stayed active. And so here's a, a snapshot of one of our competitions. You see Donald, he probably didn't win. I'm sure I came back that week. But um, <laughs> at the top, me, uh, there's our son, Josiah, Noah, right? We're all a, a part of this competition. But what it does show us is our activity during the day. So this particular day, you can see that I wasn't really getting up every hour, right? There are hours that pass without me moving. And it makes me conscious of that time that I'm not um, active. It also helps uh, us to, to raise kids that are thoughtful about their activity during the day, right? So they're getting up and moving around because their Fitbit is buzzing that they've been seated for 50 minutes and you want to get up and make this time. And so this is a way that we make um, uh, make sort of this a fun activity in our family, right, by making it competitive, but it's also helping us to, to improve our health and to keep track of this data. I love that you can look at the aggregate of the data. Um, this was an interesting goal. The goal was four million steps in a year. And notice that uh, midway through September was close to three million. And so it was like, oh, I wonder if I can push it to get to a four million step goal. Who knows if they've done four million steps in a year? Psh. No? Right. So having these goals for our family actually improves our activity and improves our overall health because we're able to see the data. We're also able to see, like, where are these peaks happening? Where are we having really good days where we're getting 15,000 steps? What am I doing on that day? And how can I make more of those days happen? Um, the other thing that uh, my family likes to do is work out. Believe it or not, this is a picture uh, my husband teaches spin. And this was on Thanksgiving Day because, you know, I mean, if you're going to eat poorly, I feel like if you work out in the morning, like it justifies, you know, what, what's going to happen later. So we actually went and did spin uh, on Thanksgiving morning. We try to be a really active family. Uh, my husband also plays racquetball, and he's sort of that type A personality that writes everything down. He's very meticulous and detail-oriented. That's probably many of you in the room. He keeps track of his racquetball data. This is by his heart rate. So here you're looking at different heart rate intensity zones. So gray is the lowest zone, and then it goes to sort of a um, charcoal and blue, and then red is really high intensity, followed by yellow and then green. Uh, notice that he has notes in the corner, right? So he goes in to the app to put in notes to correspond to his data. I know, yeah, I, I married up. <laughs> Woo! Uh, here's his training data. He said, racquetball singles with Zachary. One, four of four games. Not, I mean, he's so modest, really. Um, and in fact, you can see where his heart rate intensity was picking up, right? Just looking at his heart rate trace, right? He's, he's uh, playing four games. He's going and going and going. He's got some pushes at the end. Great, you know, so the statistician in me is love and looking at his data. And so I'm skimming through and I'm like, oh, honey, wait a minute, a couple, this is not a week later. A week later, you're playing with Jimmy. You won one and you lost two. Oh, gosh, what, what happened? And so I wanted to uncover what was different about that day. I said, well, when I look at your data, you've got these peaks of where you're playing, but then you kind of have this lull in between. Like, I didn't see that with your, your previous data. What was happening? What were you guys doing? I mean, Jimmy's a different person, so yeah, there's some, you know, difference. But this data looks different from when you were winning. And he said, oh, yeah, when I played Jimmy, after each round, we'd go outside, we'd have a sip of water, I'd sit down, I'd rest, my heart rate, you know, I'd cool down a little bit, and then I'd go back in. I was like, and you went back in and lost? Right, you gotta stay in there and keep it going because Jimmy's beating up on you while you're chilling, drinking water, right? And so it was interesting to sort of see the difference in the data and not just for Donald, right? This works for competitive sports teams, football teams, 
right? Basketball teams at our institution. How can we help our students see, right, the difference in their data and whether or not they win or they lose, right? How might that influence what happens? Um, last thing I want to share, uh, what else we can learn from our heart data is how, uh, how our body is changing on the inside. So early on in our marriage, um, my husband suffers from allergies and uh, we, had, we were newlyweds and one night he couldn't sleep and, and he's up and he's like, honey, I can't breathe. And I'm like, can you, can you breathe out of your mouth? You know? And he's like, yeah, but I can't breathe out of my nose. It's my nose. You know? And I'm like, well, just like your body, like, your body's not going to let you not breathe out of your mouth. Like, let's just see about this in the morning. And he's like, no, no, I think we need to go to the ER. And so I'm like, fine. You know, I, I don't want you to die on my watch. This is just the first month. Your, you know, your parents are going to think I did it. And so, um, and so I get up and I drive him to the ER. I kid you not, that was my thought. It wasn't his health. It was like, people are going to blame me in my cooking. Like, I, eh, let me just take you to the doctor. So we get to the ER and um, we walk in and I say, you know, hi, my husband's having trouble breathing, you know, and I'm like out of his nose, but the mouth is working fine, you know. Um, <laughs> And the doctor sort of looks him up and down, and he's like, let's take you to the back. We're going to run an EKG and do a CAT scan, and we're going to, and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, no, no, he's, it's allergies, I'm sure it's allergies. And so we get rushed to the back, and we're telling the doctor what's happening, and I'm like, hey, you guys are overreacting. He just, he, he took this medication, and he took some Afrin, and then he did a nasal decongestion, and, and the doctor was like, we're just going to, you know, we got this, we might have to go to surgery. And I was just like, time out, like what is, am I really killing him? And so, <laughs> and so we're there and then, so, he, so my husband's getting a little frustrated because he's sort of like, well, I didn't know it was, was I that bad, you know? And I'm like, well, you, you ride your bike. Like how can, you know, how can your heart not be that good? You ride your bike all the time. And so anyway, this doctor, um, his shift was ending, so a new uh, person on call came in. This is about 4, 4.30 a.m., and we're, we're, we're ragged because we've sort of been, you know, uh, on this roller coaster of what's happening to his health. And this new doctor, he comes in, and he says, tell me, you know, what's up? I'm, lo I'm looking at why you guys are here. We think he's having a heart attack. And I said, well, I don't think that's it. He... He, he bikes a lot and, and, you know, and then we started walking him through the evening. Like we got home and he took this medication, he took some Afrin, he took a decongestant. And he said, oh, you never want to mix those two because they clog your nasal passages. Let me give you this instead. And we were like, but, like well, we told the other doctor that too and he thought it was a heart attack. And you're saying you don't want to mix these two because it did exactly what it did for my husband. It clogged his nasal passages and brought us to the ER. And he said, well, when a 300-pound man walks in the ER and says he can't breathe, you assume he's having a heart attack, and you ask questions later. And so part of me was like, well, I, I mean, I, I guess, but he's not having a heart attack, and, you know. So... This is my husband's actual heart rate, uh, heart trace data from October of 2010 through July of 2012. He started in the hypertension, pre-hypertension zone of his heart rate data. And over the course of uh, a year and a half or so, got down to a very healthy normal zone. And what was interesting to me was that this data of his heart health was really describing a process that was happening uh, on the outside, right? We, we moved to California, that in and of itself, that'll make you vegan, like as soon as you, you just, we were in Texas where no one is vegan, no one's vegetarian, I'm you know, sorry for those of you watching from Texas, yay, Texas. Um, so we moved from Texas to California and we were like, oh my gosh, these farmers market, like is this what a strawberry tastes like? Are you kidding me? Um, and so he lost over 150 pounds, and our kids have also been the beneficiary of that. We've got gardens, and we get, um, we're now, we've now actually become vegan, like we're one of some of those people. Um, but it's really changed the family dynamic and led to a, a healthy family lifestyle because we were able to look at this data, right, and see how the data was changing us and how we could also work to change that data. 
So three points I want to leave you with, four points I want to leave you with today, um, kind of my take home message. Uh, many of you, as you raise your hand, you're already taking these daily measurements about your body. But I want to challenge you to try to understand those and how can you uh, infer your health from that data, right? So what is it that you can do now that you know that you only took 3,832 steps yesterday? How is that gonna change your behavior? So how are we gonna let data change our behavior? Share our data with the doctor and with our loved ones and also get them to share their data with us, right? We're data-centric folks in this room. We're not afraid of the data. We may see patterns that our family doesn't see. We may see uh, health challenges that are coming on that we pick up just by looking at their data. So how can we um, be a conduit for helping them understand their health? And then I love this last part, thinking about how, uh, as a professor, I'm always thinking about how to broaden participation in statistics and data science. Um, what are gateways to the field outside of calculus? Calculus is a high hurdle to get folks into data science and statistics. What are other ways to enter our profession? And students are big on data, especially personal data, especially if it has something to do with maybe sports data. So how might we think about courses that might be a gateway to the major outside of sort of the traditional very heavy math calculus based track? Because I think that would help encourage students to pursue data science. Thank you so much for your time today.